This morning I would like to study with you for a while on the important, very important doctrine taught in the scriptures of justification by faith. This ties in, and you will see how as we go through this, with the general thoughts we've said recently on rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth as you study it. There is a proper way to study the Bible. There is an improper way. Paul made even a young preacher realize that in his studies when he said what he did in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, when he said, Study to show thyself approved unto not men, but unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Well, ashamed before whom? Before God. Rightly dividing, that is, as you study, Rightly dividing, American Standard 1901 says, handling aright the word of truth. Now we're going to look principally in a moment at a chapter, part of a chapter, in the book of Romans. And you might think we would if you're familiar with the New Testament when it comes to a, such a subject as justification by faith. But I have some preliminary remarks I'd like to make first. When the Roman brethren received Paul's original letter to them, it was not difficult for them to understand. And that was the case because they knew the situation, circumstances, and conditions of the Lord's church at that time in the first century. In other words, they knew the purpose and theme of Paul's epistle. They recognize that what is addressed in this letter to us as the church in Rome would apply to all churches in the first century. Sometimes we forget that these letters were written, of course, inspiration of the Holy Spirit behind each writer's writing because God wrote the Bible. But they were to be circulated and read among all of the churches. I want to emphasize this point too. This is not written to those outside of the church. Many times we think about the study of the justification, justification of faith or by faith, and we immediately begin to think of people who are not Christians. How do you become a Christian? At what point are your sins remitted? But remember, most of the letters of the New Testament are written to those who know the gospel, who have obeyed the gospel, They've been baptized to Christ. And they've been added to the church by the Lord. This is a letter concerning how you live a righteous life in the Lord in understanding properly justification by faith. We might emphasize this too. It was written in their language. There was no translation problem. Thus no versions of the Bible in which is best. None of that was involved. There was no several hundred years of apostasy at that time. There was no Roman Catholicism developing out of that apostasy. Protestant denominationalism was 1,500 long years into the future. And therefore, there was no Calvinism, there was no Baptist doctrine or Methodist doctrine or Presbyterian doctrine and its various shades and differences among them. But basically all of them saying salvation is by faith only or at the point of faith without any other acts of obedience. And there was none of the false doctrines that even have arisen among brethren that set aside the authority of the New Testament concerning what godly unity is, the unity for which Jesus prayed and Paul commanded 1 Corinthians 1.10, John 17. Their minds were not filled with hundreds and hundreds of years of confused denominational theology and the perversions thereof when they received this letter and they heard it read to them in their own native tongue. Of course, we know that this is not the case today, and it has not been for hundreds of years. 
For many centuries, false teachers have attempted to make Romans fit their erroneous theologies that permeate denominational doctrines. So when you, as a part of your responsibility in studying the Bible, seek to rightly divide the word of truth, you must approach these scriptures, whether it's Romans or Hebrews or whatever, doing your dead level best not to let your mind be cluttered with all these things that have arisen between the time they were written and today. Sometimes that takes quite an effort. But it is essential as anything I can think of to make sure you get the message that the apostle wanted you to get. So today people come to the inspired letter with their minds preconditioned by all kinds of error. And because their minds are preconditioned with that error, it makes Romans, it can be true of a number of books, if not all of the Bible, but especially Romans, difficult for them to understand. Now, with the previous points before us, I would like then to spend the rest of our time studying the topic I've already announced, justification by faith. Now, we will be studying Romans 4, verses 1 through 8. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I didn't mention this to Gary, but if he wants to put Romans chapter 4, 1 through 8 up on the screen, uh, we'll be looking at those verses. And we've got a while before we get there, so you don't have to hurry. Romans 4, 1 through 8. We want to make sure, and this is true of any any word, any verse, any sentence, any paragraph, any letter, that we study the passage in its context. What is context? Well, let's see if I can do it this way. The environmental context of this room is considerably different from the environmental context just outside those walls. Thus, if we study our actions in here, physically speaking, then we must consider the impact of this air conditioning, this environment with that outside. I remember the time as a young preacher, I know John does, that we preached in some places that you would melt down in as you preached. And I've literally stood here like this, shifting back and forth and felt the sweat squeeze in my shoes. Well, that makes a far cry difference, physically speaking, regarding the impact of temperature on me, though I preach the same gospel, but for me personally, than it does right now. Well, when it comes then to the literary environment, we need to understand that that's an important part of rightly dividing the word of truth, too, when we seek to study the scriptures. Because denominational theologians have so long misused the words faith, this is important to get in your mind, these are very familiar terms to you, and works, faith and works, they've been misused. Here's the challenge to us. We must use them as the Holy Spirit guided the Apostle Paul to use them that fits into the context of the environment of that time without letting all these many centuries and what all people have done to try to justify false doctrines by twisting scriptures to make these things fit when it comes especially to our topic, which is justification by faith. I want you to notice how we see in chapter 3 of Romans, in verse 28, this environment, literary environment set. Paul's been reasoning. In chapter 1, remember, this is written to the church, not those outside it. In chapter 1, he says, how did you Gentiles get in the mess you're in, for the most part, at the time I'm writing this letter? And he tells them how they departed from God, desired not to retain God in their knowledge, 
being free moral agents, God said, all right, if you don't want me, you don't have to. So he gave them up to all sorts of the mess that is currently being presented as normal in this nation. Not the first go around with that kind of thing. But it's written to the church, not written to Gentiles outside of the church. Keep that in mind. This letter was read at one time to the congregation of God's people in Rome. So they're being reminded of where you came from when you heard the gospel and became Christians. Because in verse 16, right at the beginning of the letter, he says the gospel is the power to save. And that becomes the thing that he's going to prove through this whole letter. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then in chapter 2, he points out you Jews have nothing to glorify in. Because you were given a law, and Galatians 3, verse 24 says, it was to bring you unto Christ. By the way, that's a parallel passage to our subject today. Remember, he says, it was a law given to you to bring you to Christ that you might be justified by what? By faith. So keep in mind the connections of these letters as they were written then for the purposes, that's an important point, they were written. So in chapter 2, he says, you Jews are big sinners too. You Gentiles are sinners. And you Jews are sinners. But remember, all of these have heard the gospel. They believed it. They've obeyed it. Their past sins have been remitted. The Lord's added them to the church. So why is he doing this? Because in chapter 3, after he deals with how the Gentiles in general got themselves in the mess they were in, why that the Jews can't puff themselves up and say, look how much better we are because you had a law and violated it. You didn't keep it. In chapter 3, he concludes all under sin, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all of you, regardless of your background, need the gospel of Christ. Now remember, these folks have recognized this. This is not trying to convince them that they need it. They know they need it. This is the church in Rome. They've obeyed the gospel. They know they're to be faithful to Christ in the church. But most of the letters of the New Testament are written to members of the church that they might be faithful. There is a common thread that runs through a number of letters that Paul wrote that we miss sometimes. He was trying to develop oneness, unity, between the Jewish brethren and the Gentile brethren. That's what's going on right here. And what we might well know is as up to date as this morning's news is that as he was dealing with racism in the church, the same principles that solved it then will solve it today. But it won't be solved without the gospel. And it won't be solved without living the Christian life in the church. And the problem that he was facing and the church was facing is the attitude the Jew had toward the Gentile and the Gentile toward the Jew that even after they'd obeyed the same gospel, they were having problems. But there's another addition here that must be considered. There were the unbelieving Jews who would not believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They're the ones that put him to death. But you will remember as years went by, there were Jews, and Acts 15 tells us, they came from the sect of the Pharisees who believed the gospel and obeyed it. And guess what they tried to do to the Gentiles? They tried to say, you Gentiles can be saved by Christ, but you must be circumcised and keep the law. In other words, their plan of salvation for the Gentile convert was, yes, you must believe in Christ. You must repent of your sins. You must confess your faith in Christ. You must be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. And for the men, you must be circumcised and keep the law. That was the plan of salvation that the Judaizing teacher taught for the Gentiles. Paul, being an apostle and guided by the Holy Spirit, when he saw this thing come from Jerusalem to the church in Antioch, which was a Gentile church, he and Barnabas immediately rose up, being guided by the Spirit, and took issue with these people.
Then they went down to Jerusalem in Acts 15 not to learn what the truth was. They knew the truth. But to find out who started this stuff, which, by the way, is authority for us to research the thing, find out where this mess is coming from, and get to the bottom of the matter. And they did. And that's where we find out that this came from Pharisees who had believed and obeyed the gospel. And thus they wrote a letter back to the Gentiles saying, nobody came from us teaching this as part of the gospel. And here's what we are saying that the Gentiles are to do and not do. And actually you have a letter contained there that uh, is quoted by Luke. All of that's involved. So guess who Paul is primarily dealing with since this letter was written to the church in Rome to Gentile converts and Jewish converts. It's written to refute the Judaizing teacher. There are no second class citizens in the kingdom of heaven. There are people with different amounts of knowledge and different abilities and different ages and growth and development. But they're all under the authority of Christ as manifested in the word of God. So we have to understand the term faith and the term works as the Holy Spirit guided him to apply it to the environment of the church at that time and the purpose for which Paul wrote this letter as he did other letters. Now this gets us to Romans 3.28. And remember our text we're going to deal with a little more later on is Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. But look what he says in chapter 3, 28. Therefore, we conclude. I often point out that wherefore and therefore and hence and so are terms that says I've given you the facts and the matter and I've reasoned correctly with the facts and here's our conclusion. He tells you right here, even though he uses the word therefore, that he's drawing a conclusion on the basis of what he has written them and he wrote to the church for their benefit. Notice, therefore, that means a lot of what I just told you. Reason with correctly. We conclude. So he's reaching a conclusion. What do you conclude, Paul? What does the Holy Spirit conclude? What is important to conclude here concerning the conduct of Gentile and Jewish brethren with one another and the oneness that God expects between brothers and sisters in Christ? That a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, if you're going to try to drag in Roman Catholic doctrine and Protestant denominational doctrine and try to make verse 28 fit their doctrines, you're going to be in a mess. But listen, none of that was around. They were Jews, a minority of people for the whole Roman Empire. There were the few Christians, smaller than that, and the great majority were pagan Romans. They had no background. There wasn't a Baptist preacher around. There wasn't a Methodist preacher around. There wasn't a Roman Catholic priest. There wasn't a Greek patriarch under the Eastern Orthodox system. There wasn't any kind of denominational preacher around. They had no idea about anything like that. It wasn't in their mind. So they had to see things as they were then in the church. And they understood that, as I said at the beginning. They had no problem with reading this book like many people and most people do today. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And he's going to develop that right on through the letter. Because he's already said the gospel is God's power to save. So he said two key things in Romans 1, 16 and in verse 28. So he's contrasting the gospel New Testament system and the works, faith and works, works of the law of Moses of the Old Testament. That you must keep in mind. Not the way denominational people divide this through their creeds that have existed for hundreds of years, but in the situation of the times. The word faith is used comprehensively of all that the believer does in compliance with God's commands under the New Testament system. Again, let me emphasize, although there are principles here that certainly would apply, 
This is written to members of the church. He doesn't have to persuade them that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He doesn't have to persuade them about the church and what the church is, that all the saved are in the church. There's just the church, Judaism and paganism. That's all there is in the world at this time. They have heard the gospel, fully persuaded by it. They've obeyed the gospel, but they have some hang-ups. Now, this may tell us that a lot of times when people from the heart obey the gospel, that that doesn't mean they've gotten rid of all of the stuff they had in their lives, contrary to the will of God, that they're going to have to work on once they get in the church. Because after all, we're taught throughout the New Testament letter pertaining to Christian living how much we're to grow in the knowledge. Well, now, if you know it all after you rise from the watery grave of baptism and you don't need to know any more, how are you going to grow? And these people needed this letter, as did all the churches of the first century, that they could grow in their unity between Jew and Gentile brethren. Okay. The word works are references then to give emphasis to what I've already said, to the works of the law of Moses. Now, a law system means you must keep it perfectly. A pure law system means you can never violate any aspect of it. And God, therefore, will pay you with heaven because you never violated the law. Who did that? Not any mortal. Somebody had to come and do it for us. Who did that? Who was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin? And sin's a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Who said my food and my sustenance is always do the Father's will? Who said on the cross it is finished? Why Jesus Christ did. He's the one that did for us what we never, 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 never could do for ourselves. He could live the law flawlessly. There's no way death could hold him. There's no way heaven could reject him because he lived it perfectly. And by, listen, merit, heaven was his. Nobody else has been able to do that. For all the sin and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. And once you violate any aspect, any component part of a pure law system, the whole body of law condemns you. So it doesn't make any difference whether you have held the clothes of those who stoned Stephen or whether you were one of those throwing rocks or whether you were a fornicator like the Gentiles regularly did or an adulterer or a homosexual or whoever you might be living contrary to God's will. It doesn't make a difference how men rate it. If you stole your neighbor's lawnmower well, that's certainly not the same as murdering him. But it transgresses God's law because you're a thief. And that separates you from God. And all men, one way or the other, one extent or the other, have violated God's will. So faith here and works that we're talking about is used in that way. So Paul's not contrasting faith with works of obedience to the gospel. Notice what's said by Peter in 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Peter makes it clear that it's by your obedience. Well, as far as I know, when I obey anybody, I work. You husbands know when you obey your wives, you work. <laughs> That's the simplest illustration I can use. It was not a meritorious work, at least when it comes to the gospel system. Peter said, you purified your souls through obedience to the truth. 1 Peter 1, 22. And he's not using the term works in the sense of obedience to the gospel. So I must see it as they saw it then and not through denominational lies that rebels against any kind of works. That didn't exist then. I think I pointed out to you 
that if you read your New Testament, you'll notice nobody ever fusses about, must I be baptized to be saved? The battleground was, is Jesus Christ of Nazareth the only begotten Son of God? Is He the way, the truth, and the life? And no man comes to the Father but by Him. That was the battleground. Once you prove to that kind of honest hearer, Luke 8, verse 15, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Savior, then they were ready to do whatever He asked them to do by responding to the conditions that He laid down in His Word whereby they would receive by faith the blessings. So Paul is contrasting justification by the gospel or New Testament system with justification which the Jews sought by being identified principally by circumcision and as a fleshly descendant from Abraham with the law of Moses, works of the law. Now the denomination people come along and they read this with their denominational background of saying there's not anything a man can do in order to be saved. You're saved about salvation by faith only. And they read works of the law as no law whatsoever. If you're saved by grace through faith, you're not saved by any law at all. That wasn't even in the mind of the people of the first century. And that wouldn't be in the mind of people today if it hadn't developed this false doctrine many, many years ago in the Protestant Reformation, 500 years, by 1,500 years too late for this. So let's recall, and I'm doing a lot of this for emphasis, in the time of the European, the European Protestant Reformation, they're protesting what they consider to be corruptions in the Roman Catholic Church. People today are, they don't even know what a Protestant is. But anyway, that's what it started out with. And the Reformers were objecting to and combating the meritorious works with the Catholic clergy over time had imposed upon the people. Having read in Romans other uh, passages that salvation is by faith and not by works, then they applied such passages to the problem which they were facing and not to the problem that was being faced in the first century church before there was Roman Catholicism and before there ever was Protestant denominationalism. A significant and important mistake in not dividing the word of truth. It is wrongly dividing it. The error caused them then to misapply Paul's use of the terms faith and works. They concluded that there's nothing to do to be saved except to believe, faith only. And of course, I don't know how much you think about it, but if you deal with pure doctrine of Calvinism, they insist that even faith is a gift. And it's given only to the unconditionally predestined. Remember, Calvinism says back there in eternity, God foreordained some to be saved whether they want to or not and son to be lost whether they want to or not because their want to is not there. Because born into this world, they've inherited, just like they inherited the color of their eyes, all the way back to Adam, the very sin, Adam, that's the original sin, that Adam had committed, and they're inclined to no good thing at all. They couldn't be saved if they would, and they wouldn't be saved if they could, for they're devoid of anything good. So it all has to be on God's side. And Jesus only died for those that God predestined to be saved. He didn't die for those that God predestined to be lost. So since man's inclined to no good thing at all, how are these predestined to be saved going to know they're saved? There has to be a direct work of the Holy Spirit come upon them and tell them that you're one of the elect. You're one predestined to be saved. And if you read anything, especially when Calvinism really prevailed back in the early 19th century and really throughout the 19th century, a few places today, you'll see then that they don't ever offer any invitation. There's no use doing it because you can't respond to the truth. You're inclined to no good thing at all because you've inherited Adam's original sin, and you can't. So there's God, it's all on God's side. And that's the reason, as it's corrupted among the denominational churches that they'll talk about salvation by grace only and salvation by faith only. I, I've never quite figured that out. If salvation by grace only and salvation by faith only, one and one is what? Two. So how, why they can't add there, I don't know. But that's what they say. I'm not telling you what's right. I'm telling you what they teach. So we understand why baptism, something obviously one must do 
An action on the part of man has been so adamantly opposed as being necessary to salvation because they only see that work as a meritorious work. Because they've approached such studies as this through the eyes of Protestant Reformation rather than as it was in the first century. And they have on colored spectacles that if you look at that white over there, but it's tinted green, you're going to see a green tinted white. Or if it's tinted blue, you're going to see it tinted blue or whatever color. They don't know to step outside of those human doctrines and just study the Bible as it was, which involved in writing about the word of truth, understanding the situation as it was in the first century. And Paul's use by the Spirit of such terms as faith and works and what his purpose for writing this letter was had nothing to do with saving a person outside the church. It had to do with making you what you ought to be in oneness in the church because you all are saved. You are Gentile by the gospel of Christ. And thus you're justified by faith, which Paul says, and the Holy Spirit's guiding him, concludes that we're saved by justification by faith without the deeds of the law. And a deed's something you do. So they will say it is a work, something to do, that is, baptism, and therefore can be no part of man being saved. And that's how they reason, if they reason at all. But in all this reasoning, they're using the word works in a different context and thus giving it a different meaning than did the Apostle Paul in view of the conditions, circumstances, situations of the church at the time that he wrote this to members of the church concerning how, concerning how they are to be one in Christ, which Paul desired. Remember how he talks about in Colossians, they broke down the middle wall of partition to remove that old law that kept everybody apart. And you who obey the gospel, Jew and Gentile, must understand it's removed. And your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, all of that to lay the groundwork to chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Paul says, and remember there were no chapters and verses in these letters. Men put those in here. But we have them to reference, and that's good. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Okay, I'm going to take you back to the patriarchal age, Paul says. And we're going to look at Abraham, who they knew was selected as the father of the faithful. He's the epitome of being faithful to God and being saved by faith. Remember what he's concluded up here in verse 28, and there were no chapters and verses. Wherefore, we conclude that a man justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So, when you drop down here to verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? He's trying to get their mind with them. You ask that question as you think this through. Well, since the Judaizers, these Jewish Christians who demanded that the Gentiles be circumcised in order to be saved, again, I cite Acts 15, 1 and 2, showing you where that came from. Since they were making so much of the flesh, Paul reminds them of the case of Abraham. Their national father in the flesh. Here's the point. God justified Abraham when he was of no particular fleshly identity and law and before he was circumcised. He is doing some fantastic debating and refuting their arguments. Look how the Jew looked at Abraham. But he never was under the law. And he was considered faithful before he was circumcised. Circumcision was given to Abraham because he was a faithful servant of God, not to make him a faithful servant of God. That ought to be understood. So he's asked that question. He's trying to tune their minds in on where we're going, that the gospel is the power of God to save, and that we conclude that the man justified by faith without the deeds of the law, and that God has concluded, Romans 1 and 2, and then in chapter 3, all people, Jew and Gentile alike, under sin and in need of the gospel. In verse 2, for if Abraham were justified by works, well, what works are you talking about? Works of the law. Remember, they know nothing about how people in the denominational world use the word works today. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. 
In other words, if you live flawlessly and never violated the law or if whatever it was that God had given as your standard of conduct, guess what? You can stand before God and say, I deserve heaven. I deserve it. I never violated any law that you laid down for man. So Abraham was not justified by perfect law keeping in reference to some particular law. So he was not justified by works, and that is law keeping. And therefore in his justification he had no reason for boasting. Now here's the point. No other than the father of the Jewish nation represented a denial of the very claim of the Judaizers. Abraham himself Refudiated or refuted the Judaizers. But go with me to verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Paul, where, where are you basing all of your reasoning? Where are you getting all of this? And at the same time, what are you saying to these people who know about Abraham but they don't realize what it means? What says the scripture? That's what we all always ask. What saith the scripture? You say this and you say that and you deny this and you uphold that. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now this goes back to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. And Paul cites that as scriptural proof for Abraham's being justified by faith and not by perfect law keeping. That's the reason his father was faithful. And this was before Abraham was circumcised. That's recorded by Moses in chapter 17. God imputed or reckoned Abraham's faith into righteousness. He forgave Abraham because Abraham believed God. Being forgiven, he was then righteous without sin. That's what that means. When you're righteous before God, God sees you without sin. But all the sin comes short of the glory of God. How can you ever get in that shape? Well, watch him develop this. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, that is favor, something you get you don't deserve, but of debt. That's the way it works under our law system. But he's not talking about after 2,000 years of all of the denominational stuff that's come along and their definition of salvation by faith only and works. He's talking about as it was then. Keeping in mind Paul's use of faith in the gospel system of salvation and works of the law of Moses which was pressed by the Judaizers in the church and we've seen that in 328 we conclude that we're justified by faith without the deeds of the law I think it's easy to see that in this verse Paul is simply stating the fact that perfection and obedience to law makes the ensuing reward a matter of debt God owes you something. But God would owe such a one salvation if he owed him anything, but he doesn't. He would not be an object of God's grace. When you have a perfect law system and someone lives perfectly according to that law, what need of favor is there? Favor means you had a law and you broke it. And God's going to provide a way for you to be saved even though the law condemns you and says you ought to go to hell. And that's what they didn't understand. Now reading verse uh, 5, But to him that worketh not, well, worketh what not? The law of Moses. But to believe, or any law system that God might have put on the earth. But believeth on him, believeth on him through the gospel system. Remember what he said in Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God to save. That justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. What? When I hear the gospel and understand it, knowing I'm a sinner and that I am condemned to eternal damnation if I die in that state, I stand guilty before God. And I believe that gospel and repent of my sins, confess my faith in Christ. And I am baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. Guess what? That's counted in God's mind for righteousness. And when I rise in that watery grave of baptism, 
the old man's dead, and God sees somebody as if though he had never sinned. It has to work that way because God's a perfectly just God. And he's got to remain just while he saves those who are not just. And that was the big confusion until, guess what? The gospel comes and reveals that God's not going to save you by a pure law system because that's an impossibility on the part of man. He can't do it. So he's authored a plan. What? Oh, one of the Godhead three would come and become a man, be tempted at every point like as we are, yet without sin. Thus the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, go to the cross and die on our behalf, not because of anything he did. And our belief through the gospel in him and our compliance with the conditions of salvation by faith, we can rise from that watery grave of baptism clean as if we had never sinned. And thus he imputes, in fact, in the Greek, it better translate reckoned, it's the countenance term, uh, you are put over on the side where you don't know anything. It's just as if you had never sinned. This is how I refute the Judaizing teacher who tries to bring over this meritorious idea of law and says you Gentiles must be circumcised and keep the law. So that's a very important point. So to the Romans to whom Paul wrote, they had no problem understanding his message. It's when you mix all this denominational error in from the apostasy that Roman Catholicism grew out of through the Protestant denominationalism of the last 2,000 years and then you try to use those terms in Paul that Paul used by the Holy Spirit and see them all in the light of man's confusion. First of all, remember he wrote this to Christians. He didn't write it to anybody to convert them. All the materials in it, it certainly shows us how one is converted and what point one is saved. So, very quickly... Paul shows in verse 7, verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Who are those? Those who obey the gospel. Remember, it's God's power to save. He established that in Romans 1.16. So Paul shows that he's talking about forgiveness of sins when he speaks of one's faith being imputed unto righteousness. And then he quotes David of all people. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's a wonderful statement. Will not reckon sin. Every time I read that in my mind, this happens. Who is that man? I want to be him. Who is that man? I want to be that man. Well, notice that he's saying that a man can be happy or blessed. Because God forgave him his sins, conditioned him upon man's faith in Christ, conditioned upon man's faith in Christ. And it's an obedient faith. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. Now this is the one to whom the Lord does not reckon or impute sins to the one forgiven of his sins. And then John tells us, 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. President's verb keeps on cleansing. The very blood Christ shed and the power of it that's applied to you in the waters of baptism when you're baptized into his death, and it was in his death when he shed his blood, continues to wash away your sins so you will stand before God as if you had never sinned, as you're faithful to those things that have to do with living the Christian life and the Lord's spiritual body, the church, which was purchased by the precious blood of Christ, Acts 20 and verse 28. Now think of the many accounts Luke records in Acts in the cases of conversion. And you'll see faith is something to do. Repentance is something to do. Confession of faith in Christ is something to do. Baptism is something to do. But all such doings are works. Paul's not speaking in Romans 4, verses 1 through 8. They've already done this. He's talking about faithful Christian living. He's talking about oneness between Jew and Gentile. He's talking about the unity of the church. And he's talking about how they ought to view one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and how they've all been made free from sin by all obeying the same gospel. Well, time's getting away from us. I hope you see that this is something that is a never-ending study.
and it's rich indeed for those who are serious about their Bible study in the right division of the Word. Justification by faith, by a system of faith that is the gospel system, the power of God to save, and not by the works of the law of Moses. And the oneness that comes about in the church, because everybody that's in it, so all believe and obey the same gospel. And the Lord's added every one of them to the same church. And they're one, listen, in Christ Jesus. If you haven't become a Christian, then we've done, I hope, a tolerable job for those who listen in teaching you exactly how to be justified by faith. If you have wandered away as a Christian from the things that pertain to being faithful, we urge you to repent of them, confess them, and pray God forgiveness. We urge you to do so now if you need while we stand and sing. Mm -hmm.